Yeah. Aloha and welcome back to Shrink Wrap Hawaii and welcome back to Me Too. I was on a little vacation and it's a little nerve wracking being here in the hot seat again, but I have my good buddy Tomas Cummings, PhD. Welcome, Tomas. Thank you. Happy and, to be here. Uh, Tomas is the director of Mindful Matters in Kailua. Mm -hmm. And. Um, before we get into the nuts and bolts of that, I'd like to get to know you a little bit. Sure. Where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Uh, grew up in the M states, Minnesota, Michigan, Missouri, <laughs> and really grew up a lot later in Colorado and then moved to Hawaii in 99. Uh-huh. Yeah. Why all the moving around to the M states? Uh, it's just the nature of the economy at the time and my father's uh -huh. employment. And, I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah. And... How did you end up in Hawaii? I actually got my internship at the Honolulu VA, and it oh. was the first year for psychologists that did this computer matching, and I ended up in paradise. Lucky you. Yeah. And obviously you stayed. When was that? 99. 1999, so yeah. 17 years ago? Yeah. 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 And so reading uh, the information that you sent to me and from our conversation way back when. Mm -hmm. um, meditation is an uh, important part of your practice, yes. is that right? Yes, yes. It's, it's part of my personal life. It's part of my therapy practice when uh, clients are open to it. Yeah. So you were saying before we started how um, meditation is hard. Yeah. Why is it so hard? It sounds like the easiest thing in the world, doing nothing. <laughs> yeah, it, it's actually elusive because there's not much in our culture that has us doing nothing. We've become human doings. We've forgotten how to be. We're always multitasking, and we're rewarded for this, right? I mean, we're mm -hmm. on the phone, we're, uh, we're, playing, you know, we're texting at the same time, we're having a conversation and drinking our coffee, and some people are even driving while they're doing all that. Right. So it's a culture of multitasking, we're rewarded for it, and we've long since forgotten how to sit and be still. And yet our brain needs this. Our brain needs stillness in the awake mode. We can get stillness in our sleep, but it's different. Meditation restores our brain in a way that sleep alone cannot do. So is it actually possible to think about nothing? I don't think so. I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried. Maybe if you grow up being a monk from a young boy or a young woman. But, you know, meditation techniques that are um, approached by most normal human beings, not the super meditators, right. involve focusing the mind on one thing. Right. To still the mind. Yeah. And using that as kind of a ground, and every time the mind wanders, you notice, you bring it back to mm -hmm. that one object of concentration. Like your breath. Yeah. And the breath is the most common across centuries, across cultures, across the globe. The, the breath is a common focus of meditation. The breath, the body scan, certain muscle groups, a mantra in TM, Transcendental mm -hmm. Meditation, you're given a mantra. Right. It's, it's Some a special saying. word. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a saying in Pali or Sanskrit, and you repeat that over and over again to serve as the object of focus. I'm so glad that yeah. you said that when I asked you, you know, is it possible to think about nothing? Because I had a discussion with somebody else who said that they <clears throat> meditate, and I've never found it possible. Mm -hmm to think about nothing, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. And this person said, oh yeah, I do that. And I was just, so I think they just weren't being honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't think about nothing. Yeah. I mean, thinking is, is a habitual behavior of our brain, if you will. And it's really hard to rein in the brain. I think a, a key to being very successful in life is to be able to focus intently on one thing at a time so that you're fully present and not distracted. And in fact, the, you know, what people have come to identify as a moment of happiness is when we're in flow and it's when we're right. totally in the moment, right. doing something 
in such a way as we're fully engaged without any other voice going, uh, you shouldn't have done that, or you should do this, or mom said this, or you got to do that. Just totally in the moment. Right. Those, those are yeah. beautiful that's, moments. That's the flow. Playing basketball, yeah. running on the beach, making love. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You live for those moments. Yeah, we do. <laughs> we do. Yeah. And so some of the resistance that I run into sometimes is when I talk about meditation, especially with people who are extremely anxious, mm -hmm. is the first reaction, I just can't do that. Uh, that's a common reaction. Yeah. You, you couldn't walk when you first were learning to walk either. It takes a while. It's a skill we develop with regular practice over time. And that, that's what I see my role as, as a psychotherapist, is helping people still the mind, helping them get a little more mental discipline. Because with anxiety, the mind goes and goes and goes way ahead, thinking of all the possible things that could go wrong. Right. And, and focusing on that, rather right. than focusing on success. Focusing on, it, it would be folly not to think about what could go wrong, and, and yeah, not to be prepared to for that. You need to protect yourself, right, yeah. But there's a certain point at which, we protected ourselves enough, and yeah. a after that, we're just, you know, just kind of almost what Ram Das calls praying for what we don't want to happen. Right. That's what worrying is, right? Like focusing <laughs> on what we don't want to happen. So, so there's a myth in the mind that says, oh, we're protecting ourselves. But actually, we're, we're living in kind of, you know, a futuristic hell, you know, when we think mm -hmm. about all the stuff that could go wrong. Whereas, Really, it's from psychological research and many paths of inquiry from philosophical or religious perspectives, happiness resides in the moment, being in the moment, being in the present as much as possible. Whereas anxious people tend to live in the future, also worried about what can go wrong. Depressed people often live in the past about, oh, I wish I didn't do this. Oh, my life sucks. I'm such a loser. Being in the present is what we have Ultimately, that's where we have some control yeah. over our destiny. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I actually, I did a, a workshop with John Kabat-Zinn a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. And he developed this uh, way to deal with chronic pain yeah, yeah. through mindfulness. Yeah. And um, even when people say they're in pain all the time, they're not aware of their pain all the time. Correct. Oh, I, I, yeah. I think that's true almost universally yeah yeah so the trick seems to be to expand the moments when you're not focused on the pain yeah yeah and the other part of the trick is when we're focused on the stories our head tells us we should be focusing on the scary stories of the future or the pain and how limiting it is to be able to notice that you're doing that acknowledge it and then go back to focusing on solving problems to prevent that stuff from happening, or to just enjoying the moment. And focusing right. on, there's, there's a whole new movement um, in pain management that's about focusing on comfort and developing a sense of comfort. Yeah. So yeah, John Kabat-Zinn started um, in 1979 with mindfulness-based stress reduction. Right. He started in the base, basement of Massachusetts Teaching Hospital. Right. Said to all the docs and all the wards, give me your hardest patient. <laughs> And now they have a whole wing, a mindfulness center, where on any night of the week there are two or three classes running filled with 20 to 25 people. Because the research on mindfulness-based stress reduction is pretty powerful in terms of reducing anxiety, fighting depression, um, and in terms of pain management, in terms of many health outcomes that are relevant to all of us. Do you use that particular model? I've, yeah, I've been trained by John Kabat-Zinn and Saki Santorelli. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's... Yeah, I yeah, my yeah because that's, they've, made, they've taken it and developed it in such a way as it's accessible to the average Joe, you know, the yeah. average Joe or Alice, and make, makes it very accessible and doable. Uh, John Kabat-Zinn says it's Zen without the Zen. Right. So you can be Christian and do this. You can yeah. be of any faith and do yeah. this, and it's not a conflict. Because yeah. what they've done is kind of distilled the essential features of meditation and some of the essential features of a Buddhist approach to controlling the mind. And, and it's a good uh, practice that has been demonstrated to have a lot of results for increasing peace and happiness in people.
So. Yeah, he told uh, some funny stories. One of them was um, he was working with a, a group of therapists. And so they, they did his workshop, and then a year later they came back. Yeah. And he asked them, how's your practice? And they started talking about their clients. Yeah. <laughs> which is what, not what he meant. Yeah, yeah. He meant, how's your own meditation practice, yeah. Yeah. right? And then the other funny thing he said, at the very end of our week-long seminar, you know how like very often at the beginning and end of a meditation uh, period, they'll have that little bell? That yeah, little, the little bell. Ding, yeah. ding. And it kind of got mixed up. What was the beginning and what was the end? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the last time it rang, you know, somebody said, was that the beginning? Or was that the end? And he said, yes. He said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I guess the whole point is to try to make your life to be mindful about everything you do. Exactly. You know, that's a good point. Because I think a common conception is that meditation is you're checking out to rest the brain. You're uh -huh. checking out. Uh -huh. When in fact you're checking in with this kind of meditation. And that's what makes it so applicable to everyday life. You, when you sit, as we call it, it's just sitting, sit. you know, and there are many positions for sitting, but there, you know, there are certain postures that are more conducive to sitting for longer periods of time without hurting. Yeah. You know, it's good for you and also less distracting from pain. But when you sit, difficult emotions do come up, like you said, with anxious people. Difficult mm -hmm. memories do come up. But you learn to just keep breathing. You note them, as one of my Vipassana teachers told me, the happiness is in the noting. You note it. It's just that story again. <clears throat> Excuse me. You focus your mind again on the breath, on the object of concentration. And so you learn through the practice in sitting how to manage your mind in day-to-day -day life. So if you're driving, it's not a good time to get all caught up in some sad memory. You learn to say something like, okay, that's a sad memory. It can wait. I've got to focus on driving now. I've got to focus on this conversation. I've got to focus on my work. You, so two things are happening, two or three, when we meditate. And even the Dalai Lama talked about this. One is that we do get into a very rejuvenative state. It's mm -hmm. good for our health. It activates or upregulates the parasympathetic nervous system, which mm -hmm. builds the immune system, helps our digestion, helps our muscles recover, and many other benefits. So we get into this restorative state. But the second thing that's happening is we, we are flexing in a, a mental muscle we might call concentration. Mm -hmm. So we're developing a discipline of the mind that's done in a very gentle way, by the way, a discipline of the mind to think about what we want to think about when we want to think about it, right. which is a great skill to have, to stay focused on your work when you're working, to sit with the difficult feelings in therapy or with a friend when you need to do that. Sit, feel the feelings, process them, and move on, mm -hmm. you know? Because I think what happens is this all gets mixed up in our day-to-day -day lives and we're less efficient at everything we're doing. So that second skill, developing a certain discipline of the mind to focus on one thing at a time or a few things at a time to be more efficient and more effective. Okay. Yeah, um, it's so difficult though. So I'm, I always like to talk about specific mm -hmm. examples because mm -hmm. that's how I learn. Sure. So. Somebody comes in and says, I'm worried that my husband is going to cheat on me again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, that could happen. It's a possibility. That could happen. It's in the realm of possibility. Right. Yeah. But let's say uh, she knows that that worry and mistrust is not helpful yeah. to the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. But she can't stop herself. Yeah. And she thinks that somehow worrying about it and being vigilant or hyper vigilant, mm -hmm. checking his phone, looking mm -hmm. at his computer, doing mm -hmm. all of these things mm -hmm. is going to prevent him from doing that and or make her feel better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But of course it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So I, I would love to be able to have this person begin meditating 
so that she can take control of her own thoughts mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because she'd be happier in the end. Right. No right. matter what happens. Exactly, yeah. How would you talk to somebody like that? Well, it's funny you bring that up but, <laughs> because probably half of the couples that come to me for therapy are dealing with recovering from an affair, and likewise yeah. with you. It's much more common than we would think. You know, and, I'm going to stop you right yeah. there because he just whispered in my ear, but let's remember where we're at. We have to take a break and we'll be right back. Okay, thanks. Don't go away. Don't touch the mouse. You're watching SingTech Hawaii, Hawaii's leading yeah, digital media yeah, platform yeah. for and, civic uh, engagement, yeah, raising public like, awareness on tech, hey, look energy, look at, diversification, yeah, and yeah. globalism. Well, Great and content you know for Hawaii I mean, from uh, SingTech. During the first year, that's probably Aloha, I'm Richard Emery. I'm with co-host right, Jane Sugimura of Condo Insider, and Hawaii's and weekly and show about association right. living. The uh, purpose of these videos is to educate board members and condo residents about issues uh, relating uh, to association living. Uh, we hope they're helpful and uh, that they uh, assist in resolving uh, problems that uh, affect the relationship uh, between boards and their residents. Each week, Thursday at 3 p.m., we bring you exciting guests, industry experts, who for free will share their advice about how to make your association a better place to live and answer a lot of very interesting questions. Aloha. We hope you'll tune in. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you excited about my new show, which is called Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond, and it's going to be on Think Tech Hawaii from downtown Honolulu on Tuesday afternoons, 5 p.m. And we're going to talk about uh, to make architecture more inclusive on the islands, which is, what hu which is one of the definitions of humane, which is being tolerant of, uh, you know, many people of nature, of many other influences. So we're going to have some great guests, like today's guest, for example, uh, my collaborator, David Rockwood, who is the author of the awesome but he finally uh, threw in the manifestation you know. of uh, humane architecture in the background. Five. So see you on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. I look forward to. Welcome back to Shrink Wrap. I'm with Thomas Cummings, PhD, Thomas, Thomas. And so you're saying couples come in with that that scenario. That scenario. Somebody yeah. is cheated. Yeah. And there's all this anxiety. And, yeah. And then how, what do you do? Well, you know, in, in the general overview, there has to be a rebuilding of the trust. That's, right. That's inevitable. It's necessary. Yeah. And, and, of course, the person who's been cheated on is distrustful, hurt. There's some shock and trauma they have to deal with. And then, uh, as you said, a lot of anxiety. Is this going to yeah. happen again? Is it continuing? Right. And so there's always, you know, a period during which the, the person, if we call them the, you know, the victim of the affair, uh -huh. needs to be able to rebuild that trust. So they yeah. do need to be able to look at the cell phone. And the right. person who offended, who broke the trust, needs to be very forthcoming and open, transparency yeah. for a while, right? Mm -hmm. What well, can help the woman is if she's the one who has been cheated on is to help her understand that forgiveness is necessary if you're going to move forward with right. this man yeah but that's a very thick and difficult process you know right. because one of the reasons we don't forgive is to protect ourselves right and so there's a notion we have to work with that says you forgive but still protect uh -huh. And initially, there's going to be a natural tendency to overprotect right. and over time right. to protect to the amount that's more safe and sane and comfortable for both parties. Mm -hmm. So that's why the transparency at the beginning. And each time she can look at the cell phone or the email and see there's nothing going on. A little bit more mortar in that foundation of trust. Mm -hmm. If we can look at that analogy as the relationship being a house on a strong foundation of trust. Mm. Happens. Now, helping the woman deal with her anxiety, we could incorporate a practice of meditation so that mm -hmm. again she can have some control over this fear um, that it could happen again and yet still protect I don't right. want to take away this notion of protect right. and 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 rebuilding the trust yeah. but help her manage her anxiety rather than it controls her whole life now right you know what I'm saying oh yeah so with sometimes. the regular practice of meditation she can give her brain a rest and just keep focusing and of course while she's sitting it's gonna come up but she can say things like it can wait 
I'll deal with that. Focus now. Relax. Focus on the object of concentration, the breath. Which then applies to day-to-day -day life where she needs to work. She can't be thinking about and worrying so much as her husband doing this. She right. has to focus and function. She has to focus on her work, you know, her friendships, and, and just enjoying life while still protecting when she needs to do that. Does that make sense? Totally, okay. totally. So uh, yeah. let me throw in another example. Yeah. Um, sometimes where I would like to use mindfulness meditation. Yeah. So let's say our particular couple, the guy is, uh, is actually has an addiction problem. Yeah. Whether it's a sex addiction or a substance, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Or video mm -hmm. game addiction. Mm -hmm. Have you used meditation to work on that? Yes, yes, because think of it, addictions become this habitual behavior we turn to when we feel uncomfortable. Right. Even if that uncomfort, that discomfort is from boredom. Right. Oh, yeah, sometimes we I'm reach addicted for the, to playing Scrabble online yeah, with my friend. Yeah. When I have a free moment, I turn to that. Yeah. Well, it's not really a di an addiction unless it interferes with your life. Sometimes, yeah. Scrabble it can make me late. Your life. <laughs> <laughs> There's worse addictions, I'll tell you. I know, I know. That's why I'm doing this yeah. one. But, yeah, if it makes you late and so forth. Then um, what we learn to do, what I work with patients who are struggling with an addiction is First, just teach them the technique and, and really coach them along and getting it going. And, and, you know, I teach about five to seven different techniques because certain people work better with one technique more oh, than another. Well, tell me some of the different ones you use. They, they're all following the basic format of focusing on the mind on one thing, and every time you notice the mind has wandered, bring it back. Uh -huh. to the object of concentration. So the breath is the first one, and I have them focus on the rise and fall of the belly. Right, keep your hand over there. Or the breath moving in and out through the nostrils, uh -huh. where you actually feel a temperature difference. There, right, right, you know. cooler going in than yeah. coming out. Another is the body scan, and you can focus on certain muscle groups. You mm -hmm. can focus on a slow scan of relaxing the muscles one by one over the body. You know? When I do that one, yeah. I always fall asleep. <laughs> that means you needed to sleep. That's a good That's thing. That's what I say. It's, for you. it's, it's not a bad, great thing right? to do before we go to sleep. Yeah. In fact, when people practice meditation, that's one of the first things that happens. On, and, yeah. and we got to normalize that. It's good. You got relaxed. Uh -huh. Now, let's, let's deal with your sleep problem, too. You know? <laughs> Maybe you're not sleeping enough and don't have good sleep hygiene. But then I have people practice sitting up. That's why we sit up. We're not. There are meditation practices we do when we lie down, but a lot of people fall asleep. Yeah. That's why we sit in a certain posture. And you try it different times of the, di of the day, too, so mm -hmm. you don't just associate it with before going to bed, right. which is it's a great thing to do before you fall asleep. Oh, I scan. use it to help myself fall yeah. asleep sometimes. Yeah, it's a great thing. You know, I've worked with kids who kind of learn that somehow on their own. To uh -huh. fall asleep, I just yeah. relax my muscles. You know? Yeah. So getting back to this, how do you apply this to someone who has some form of addiction is yeah. you get them practicing the skill, developing the skill, and then we start to have them apply it by setting, you know, certain behavioral expectations and charts of when they start to feel the urge to uh -huh. go to the video game console, the Xbox. Or pick up some meth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah or pick up some meth. Is that they're, you know, um, they're going to practice some setting meditation. You have a whole hierarchy of things to do. You call a sponsor if you right, have a 12-step right. program and mm -hmm. so forth. But you develop a whole list of alternative behaviors to engage in before you do that habitual behavior of going to the Xbox 360, the porn on the Internet, uh -huh. the, you know, the meth or the, the right. alcohol. Yeah. That you, you start to insert a whole list of other behaviors that they can go down. Ah. Yeah. So that it becomes a kind of uh, a ritual almost. Yeah, it, it breaks the cycle of I feel uncomfortable, I, I play, you know, Halo. I go to my 360, you know, my yeah. Xbox 360, or I go to internet porn. And instead of that, I go for a walk. Instead of that, I sit and meditate. Instead of that, I call my buddy. Instead of this, I, you have a whole list of things I can do as alternative behaviors to break that cycle. Right, you know? right, because you can't do nothing. Yes, <laughs> you can't sit there and do nothing. Just like you can't think of nothing, exactly. right? Exactly. So you, so you yeah. substitute a different behavior. Exactly, yeah. And so, I mean, can that be a, a, from what you're saying, I'm thinking no, but might as well ask. Can, it, can you do that instead of going to AA, NA, 
12 step programs? Some people do, you know, because, you know, with 12 step programs, I think it's very important to find your tribe, you know. Uh -huh. If you're, you know, there are certain 12 step programs that are very Christian in orientation. Yeah. And if you're not a Christian, you just might feel out of place or uncomfortable. Yeah. In, in different age groups, too. And, you know, it's, Hawaii is a small state, so you, you have a small number of groups that you can go to, and you might not really feel comfortable with your tribe. You know? mm -hmm. Meetings are great if you feel like you're kind of, they're like me. Yeah. If you feel a complete stranger and you can't relate, you're an 18-year-old guy who has a problem with math, uh -huh. you're not going to fit in with a bunch of retired people who have a problem yeah. with alcohol. Yeah. You know, you've got to find your tribe. I think 12-step groups are great, though. I think 12-steps uh -huh. is a great recovery program in many ways. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. this can certainly augment it. It can certainly augment it. Yeah. Prayer and meditation is part of the 12-step process, you know. And I like to distinguish between the two. As, and, and I heard uh, Carlos Santana say this once at a concert you know, at Red Rocks in Colorado. He said, when you sit down and you get still and quiet and you connect with God and you talk to God and he listens, that's prayer. When you sit down and get still and quiet and you connect with God, God talks and you listen, that's meditation. <laughs> you see the difference there? And I think both are very important in one's life. Because uh -huh. prayer is a way of setting intentions and asking for guidance from God or asking for support, or whatever your higher power is. You know? yeah, Whereas gonna, meditation yeah, is a way of just stilling the mind, to be able to receive things you might not have received otherwise, because you're so busy doing, doing, doing. Yeah. Be still. In so in your paper that you gave me, I don't mm -hmm. want to miss this because it struck me you have the five pillars of happiness yes can you yeah. talk a little bit about that yeah it's this comes from a field um that we call positive psychology mm -hmm. which was born if you will in the early 90s uh -huh. um, a lot of people consider martin seligman the father of positive psychology he studied depression and learned helplessness for years <laughs> maybe he got all right I'm tired of studying depression. Maybe we should study happy people and uh -huh. see what they do and yeah, learn yeah. from them. Although there's a guy at Chica University of Chicago, Mihai Chiksent Mihai, was studying flow way back in the 50s and 60s. Uh -huh. So that's that's considered part of positive psychology too. So you know, I I developed this model that, that there are five pillars, and the first is friends and family. Uh -huh. We are social beings. We need connection. Most of us need connection. We need friends and family. And with the, whether it's family of origin or family of choice, right. it's up to you. Right. It's right. within your power. And, we, and then there's you know, subcategories under that that involve patience and forgiveness and, and acceptance you know, uh -huh. to maintain long-term relationships that are healthy. That's the first pillar of happiness, friends and family, relationships. The second one is a very intuitive one, doing what you like to do. Uh -huh. For a lot of people, that's surfing. For me, it's playing music. You know? uh -huh. For me, it's being in nature. For a lot of people, you know, doing what you like to do. That's you know. Oh, he's living, telling me we're done. You're gonna have to just shoot me the next three. Real okay, quick. the third one is living a good life, feeling uh -huh. like you make a difference, that you're part of something bigger than you. Uh -huh. The fourth and fifth are psychological in nature content of your thoughts. Happy uh -huh. people focus on the lightness in life. They don't deny the darkness. The fifth, how you think, how you process things, how you deal with the darkness. Uh -huh. The five uh -huh. pillars of happiness. Thank you so much, Tomas. Thank you, Steve. Happy we got to do this here. again. We could talk for Thank hours, you. I think. We could. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks Thank for you. joining us again on Shrink Wrap Hawaii. Tune in in two weeks. Aloha. Yeah, I'd love to come back.